The most valuable commodity I know of is information. That's what Gordon Gecko said in Wall Street. And his quote is especially true for the Bitcoin markets as it is on Wall Street itself. Unlike Gordon, though, you don't have to pay large wads of cash to get that vital information. In fact, if you know what to look for and where to look, you can get everything you need completely free. In this video, I'm going to take you through 10 of my top Bitcoin metrics. I'll show you some neat sites that track this data, as well as how you can use them to your advantage. Now, quick few things, chaps. My name is Guy, and I produce educational videos on YouTube. I'm not a financial advisor, and I'm not dishing out any sort of financial advice. Also, if you enjoy market-related content, then I do suggest subscribing to the channel. Then you get notified the moment I release another video. Oh, and one last thing. There are timestamps in the description for your convenience, so feel free to adjust playback speed to your preference. Okay, that's quite enough beating around the bush. Let's jump in. The first metric I want to look at is open interest. This is a metric that is used in both the futures and options markets. It's basically the total outstanding notional value of all futures or options contracts on the Bitcoin market. These are instruments on both listed exchanges and retail exchanges. The former being the likes of the CME and the latter being BitMEX, Bybit, Binance, etc. You can easily see the total open interest on each of these exchanges as well as on the CME website. However, if you want it all in one place, then a site that I recommend is skew.com. They have a hell of a lot of market data in the futures and options markets, and you'll see I come back to them a few more times in this video. Anyways, why is open interest important? Well, it's probably the best picture of how many people have positions in the derivative markets. What is less important than the actual number is how it has changed over time. For example, if open interest has been trending upwards recently, you can surmise that traders are getting ready for potential price action. So, to put it another way, open interest is a measure of the flow into the futures or options markets. It cannot provide guidance as to how traders are positioning themselves, but it does give an indication of how much interest traders have in the market. For example, over here you can see the open interest on the CME at the time of the halving. Both longs and shorts had strong views on this date, and for obvious reasons. More recently though, it's trended down, which shows traders are less certain of market movements currently. So, in a nutshell, I like to use the open interest as a rough metric which can tell me if other traders are seeing something I am not. And if I see a lot of open interest in the options markets, then I can actually dig a bit deeper to see which way people are positioned. This then brings me on to my next metric, the put-call ratio. As its name suggests, the put-call ratio is the amount of puts outstanding versus the number of calls. A ratio of greater than one means there are more puts being bought, which should be considered bearish. The opposite can be said for a ratio that is less than one. The put-call ratio can be calculated both on the open interest in the market as well as the volume of those being traded. For example, here is the put-call ratio on Bitcoin options over at SKU again. As you can see, the ratio is at 0.1 and 0.17 for the open interest and volume respectively. This basically shows that the amount of calls vastly outnumbers the amount of puts for both the total outstanding and the amount being traded. For those that are still new to options, a call is an option that is the right to buy, and a put is an option that is the right to sell. If there are more calls out, it means that more people are looking to buy in the future, which implies a bullish view. By the way, if you're still new to options, then I encourage you to watch my video on it where I go into them in depth. You can check it out right over here. Anyways, this put-call ratio is basically an indicator to me that all those individuals who have their open positions are expecting a price appreciation in the future. Now, although the put-call ratio gives an idea of directional sentiment, 
you can't really get a bearing of the potential magnitude of the move. This is why I tend to also look at the next metric on my list, which is the implied volatility. Firstly, it's important to understand exactly what implied volatility is. It is the volatility that the market expects in price going forward. It's calculated by looking at the price of the options in the market and extracting the volatility that is implied by these prices. It's important to make a distinction between this and historical volatility. The latter is a measure of what we've seen based on past price movements and is backward looking. Okay, so why is implied volatility an important data point? Well, it gives you a rough idea of how volatile the market expects Bitcoin to be over the coming period. It's sometimes also termed a measure of fear, as it implies that people are paying a lot for insurance in the options markets. Taking a look over at SKU again, we can pull up that implied volatility chart. Here is the rolling sixth month implied volatility. Recently, this has spiked as investors expect more volatility in the next six months. However, expected volatility was much higher only a few weeks ago around the May halving, as expected. If you wanted to be a bit more specific though, you could take a look at the relationship between the implied volatility and the realized volatility over the recent past. This can give you a good idea of how accurate Bitcoin's implied volatility has been at predicting the actual volatility in the market. As we can see here, since March of this year, it's been under predicting the most recent three months daily volatility. So that should be taken into account when assessing potential future volatility. Perhaps it could be more than anticipated. This could also interestingly mean that options are underpriced currently, which is another nice beaut of a buying opportunity. Anyways, I digress. This is not an option trading guide and I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. I just thought it was important to take you through some of my most helpful metrics here as they give an idea of how the Bitcoin spot market could be shaping up. Moving on though, the next metric that I like to look at is also particularly relevant in light of the recent crash of Bitcoin in March of this year. Correlation between Bitcoin and traditional asset classes is important as it determines how their movement will impact on Bitcoin. Historically, there's not been that much correlation between them. For example, here is the rolling correlation of Bitcoin to the S&P over the past few months. I've linked to the coin metric site where I pulled this below. Taking a look at the chart, prior to the start of this year, it was pretty negligible with a slightly negative correlation of about 10%. This basically means that Bitcoin had very little relation to movements in the equity markets. Given that it is slightly negative, it means that there is a weak argument to be made for it being a hedge to the equity markets. However, since the beginning of this year, it looks as if this correlation has been trending up. It's currently at about 20%, which, albeit still weak, is a stark reversal from the negative 10%. Now, it's important to point out that correlation is a rolling metric that's based on past data. Hence, the exact number itself is not really predictive, merely a snapshot in time. However, what is helpful to study is how this number evolves over time. As you can clearly see with the S&P example above, the trend is up. The crypto and equity markets are becoming more entwined. Does this mean that the same people investing in traditional equities are making up the bulk of crypto? Did those who dumped their stocks back in March also liquidate their crypto holdings? And if this trend continues, does this mean that we should keep an eye on the equity markets as well when making Bitcoin trading decisions? All important questions that you may want to ask yourselves. Oh, and by the way, over on CoinMetrics, you can also take a look at other correlation stats. For example, here is Bitcoin to gold and Bitcoin to the VIX. You can also look at the correlation between a number of other crypto assets, so it's a pretty handy site. Okay, that does it for some of the market data. I want to take a look at some essential on-chain data, so let's move on with my next pick. While some people like to trade Bitcoin on a regular basis, there are many others who prefer to sit and hodl. Hodl until Bitcoin reaches those lofty price predictions. Now, despite whether you actually think that Bitcoin will reach these levels, these hodlers have an important impact on Bitcoin supply on the open markets. So what I sometimes like to look at is the amount of Bitcoin addresses that are holding Bitcoin 
and not moving it. These give you an idea of how many hodlers are positioning for the long term. It shows that the broader market is long term bullish and it means that these coins are not likely to hit the open market anytime soon. Another site that should definitely be on your favorites tab is Glassnodes. They offer a host of free data and charts that you can use to read the markets. Over here, you have the total number of addresses that have a non-zero balance. This has steadily been climbing over the past year and is currently near an all-time high. You can even drill deeper and look at those that have more than one Bitcoin or more than 10, etc. All of these show that the total number of addresses are on the rise. People are buying that Bitcoin off of the exchanges and stashing it in their offline wallets. Another really telling HODL metric that I sometimes like to look at is the percentage of Bitcoin that has not moved in a certain period of time. These are called the HODL waves, and the metric was developed by Unchained Capital. Glassnodes is pretty neat in that you can choose different time frames for your HODL wave. I think the best metric to get a sense of the real HODL addresses is those that have not been moved for a year or longer. Here is what it looks like with the chosen bands at Glassnode. Anyways, on to the next metric, and this borrows something from the renowned stock-to-flow model. For those of you who don't know, the stock-to-flow model has been one of the most touted Bitcoin valuation metrics on the market. It basically tries to look at the value of Bitcoin based on the amount of stock, supply, on the market and the amount of new supply, flow, being added. This valuation metric views Bitcoin as comparable to commodities such as gold, silver or platinum. It was developed by a chap called Plan B and has become extremely popular for its relatively accurate predictions. So popular in fact that the original post has been translated into a number of languages. Just like some of the other metrics, you can pull up the graph over at Glassnodes. This black line here is the price of Bitcoin based on the stock to flow and all those dots are the actual price of Bitcoin. The color coding represents the days until the next halving. Given that we've just had one, it's blue here. Now, while the stock to flow is helpful in and of itself, another pretty neat ratio that you can look at is the current price to the price as predicted from the stock to flow. This can show you if Bitcoin is over or undervalued based on the model. You can also view this over at Glassnodes where it is called the stock to flow deflection. So roughly, if the ratio is greater than one, it means that Bitcoin is overvalued relative to this metric and vice versa for a ratio less than one. This all of course depends on how accurate you think the stock to flow is. At the most recent read of this ratio, it was close to one, which means pretty damn accurate. Oh, and a fun fact. If we pull up that stock to flow chart again, you can see that it predicts a Bitcoin price of over 90,000 in one year. What do you think? Will the model break down soon or can we realistically see that price? Let me know below. Anyways, while we're talking about coin supply, I think it's important to look at some supply side metrics. More specifically, metrics that we can look at to get a sense of the amount of coins that could be hitting the market. So my next metric is the Puel multiple. This was developed by a David Puel and is a ratio of the total dollar value of newly issued Bitcoin to the 365 day moving average of this daily issuance. It's a measure of how much supply is hitting the market relative to what was coming over the past year. This is important to determine supply because it looks at forced liquidation. More specifically, miners will generally be selling the coins that they mine in order to meet their expenses and run a profit. This forced supply means it will see more Bitcoin hitting the open market. It's important to look at this as a ratio of a historical average to get a sense of whether it is above or below the norm. There are periods of time where the value of Bitcoins being mined and entering the ecosystem is too great or too little relative to these average. Here you can see the Puel multiple over at lookintobitcoin.com. It's also available on Glassnodes. You'll notice that there are bands of red and green. These bands are relevant as they indicate ranges where you have one of two extremes. When we are in the red band, it means that miners are offloading a lot of supply. This means that the proverbial flow of Bitcoin is higher than it has been in the past. This means that if demand is held constant, supply will outstrip demand, which could have a negative impact on the price. 
It's therefore not surprising to see that the price of Bitcoin fell in periods after the multiple reached local highs. So, in general, once the pure multiple reached the red band, you can take it as a bearish indicator. On the other side of the coin, you have those periods in green. During these times, the value of new coins hitting the market is lower than it has been in the past. Assuming constant demand and less incoming supply, you have the perfect ingredients for a price increase. Therefore, in those periods where the multiple reached lows, we saw a rally in price. Anyways, this then brings me on to my final metric, which is somewhat related, and this is minor profitability. Miner profitability is a key metric for me, as it gives an idea of how miners might react in the near term to changes in their profitability. If mining becomes unprofitable for them, then they will switch off their rigs and stop hashing on the network. This then leads to a fall in the hash rate, which is strongly correlated with price. On the flip side, increases in the profitability to mine Bitcoin lead to more miners turning on their machines and bringing up that hash power. There are a number of sites like blockchain.com that track the aggregate miner revenues, but that is not as scientific. I like to look at the average miner profitability over here on bitinfocharts.com. It basically shows you the mining profitability in US dollars per day per one terahash committed. Basically, it's the marginal profitability for the miners for every single additional terahash that comes from their rigs. It's this marginal number that they will weigh up when deciding whether to keep the machines on. Anyways, as you can see here, you had a fall in the marginal miner profitability post-halving. This of course makes sense given that the revenue fell by half. You can also then see that post the halving, hash power also collapsed. This is no doubt as a result of some of those marginal miners dropping out of the market. Prices also started to fall post-halving, which is true to the correlation of hash power versus price. I should caveat though that correlation does not imply causation. Price and hash power could be moving in the same direction because of other factors. That's why I prefer to look at the minor profitability. It's also the most direct metric to be able to determine whether miners will continue the good fight or throw in the towel. Well, that's it team, a list of some of my favorite metrics to help give you an edge in the Bitcoin markets. Now, of course, I should say that none of these are 100% accurate. Sometimes relationships break down and something that could have been a completely sound trade in the past is not so today. This is why I like to take a look at a bunch of factors when reading the Bitcoin market. If you can get positive readings on most of these indicators and metrics, then you're further reinforcing your position. You're adding weight to your assertions. I also want to point out that there are a host of other tools and indicators that you can use. I just find that these have worked for me in the past, so I thought I'd share them with you. It's also pretty wide and diverse enough to give you a full picture both from a market microstructure perspective and a fundamental demand or supply angle. You can also use many of these metrics, especially the options, to inform your trading in other markets like Ethereum. Using this data is really a hidden gem that most people tend to ignore. Having said all that, one size does not fit all. You'll have to decide which metrics make the most sense to you and which tend to provide you with the most accurate picture. There are thousands of other indicators that you can use, but sometimes the most obvious are the most accurate. Well, that's it. My rundown of some quick metrics and tools that I use when looking at Bitcoin. But what do you think of this list? Any that I should have added? Please do let me know in the comments. And of course, if you like the vid, then smash that thumbs up. Also, please don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. But honestly, I have so much more that I want to share. Stuff that I couldn't really fit in this video, sadly. This is exactly why I've started a weekly newsletter. It's basically a compilation of all the interesting content that may have flown under your radar. News, reviews, analysis, and hot market tips. Want to join? Well, don't delay. Just scoot on over to the description where you'll find a link to my sign-up form. There you can enter your email address, hit submit, and hey presto, you are a Coin Bureau insider. 
My next newsletter is being worked on as we speak, one you won't want to miss. See you next time, chaps. Thank you.